On this episode of the iPhone Maker Podcast, we're shooting the great outdoors with Julian Jar. Welcome back to another episode of the iPhone Maker Podcast. My name is Ariel Martinez. On this episode, we have Julian Jari back on the show. Julian is one of my favorite guests. I love talking to him. He's very insightful on the stuff that he shoots and very passionate about his work and his craft. Julian recently took a an RV. He just bought an RV with his wife and they went and took a trip, an impromptu trip. I don't know if it was impromptu really. It seemed like it was on social media at least. But regardless, Julian got some great content. It was awesome to see all that unfold. And I wanted to invite Julian on the show to discuss what he learned, the things that he went through and the kind of gear that he took because you know we always have to talk about gear on this show but it was a great conversation that i had with julian it is always a pleasure to have him obviously it didn't only stick to this it, it went on to building our businesses and we had a conversation about that as well but regardless i think this is going to be a great episode i glad you guys are here tuned in and with all that out of the way let's get into our conversation with julian jari julian jari Thanks for coming back on the iFilmMaker podcast. How are you, buddy? I'm doing all right, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's good to be here. I'm a little, yeah, I'm good. There's a lot going on. <laughs> I can tell. We just spent about 30 minutes trying to get all this technical stuff out of the way. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, man. What have you been up to lately? My wife and I purchased an RV camper, and we've been... Uh, Taking every moment, omen, every moment we can, and just kind of bailing between shoots, and just uh, seeing the country. We've been on two, two trips. One we went out west and went out to Utah and Wyoming, and Montana, and made our way back. And then just recently went down to uh, Florida and tried to see the Carolinas and stuff on the way, on the way back. Sort of naive didn't realize how cold it was going to be it's winter uh everything Holy except cow. everything except for south florida is freezing even jacksonville was like 32 or 29 at night it's ridiculous the funny thing is for us miamians it's pretty cold <laughs> this is a pretty cold winter for miami what have you learned you got an rv have you had an rv before have you traveled through rv before um i've had it I've had a couple of vans um, before I was married. I have a, had a couple of vans that I drove. One I drove across country, and yeah, but no RV. An RV is really fun. Um, yeah, we, did, we decided to get an RV because I was looking at vans again, and you realize the price of a van, and then you start to look at the used RV market, and you realize you could buy a fleet of RVs for the price of a van, and the RV has a bathroom in it and a shower and refrigerator and heat and ac and stuff and it's pretty cool so we've had a lot of fun um one thing that i've learned that i don't really want to admit that it's sort of an internal struggle is um <laughs> less is more when it comes to gear and i'm having a realization mm. or a, you know <laughs> a, a middle uh, an internal battle with what to keep and what not to keep and what to sell and what to do next. And, you know, everything in me wants to take, you know, the big camera for the best picture. But when you go out, like it's, it's crazy what the little camera can do now. And, Oh man, it's just, it's just like, yeah, it's sort of an issue. Yeah. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I've definitely gone through that myself. I love having, the uh the big uh camera setup i used to have my zoom i see you still have your sound devices connected to your rig i used to have my zoom f6 connected to my rig um until i discovered tentacle sync and you know one thing i always try to pursue is efficiency on my sets so tentacle sync was one of the things that was able to remedy that but yeah it's it's a ton of gear and you want the good stuff, man. You want all the benefits of the pro gear, but it's a hassle. It's 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 a lot of work to to carry that on and to to get that one shot. You have a lot to set up, you know. 
No, it's just a thing. You know, you want to make, you want to have like the best image. Um, but there's a, there's an, in, you know, it's like, what do you bring and why do you bring it? And for whatever reason, I struggle with that because I want to bring like the super dope stuff. But if it's a personal project, I'm the only one motivating that, you know, it's easier when a client is like, Hey, we need this or we need that. Okay. Boom. There's, there's justification behind that. But, um, you start to, you know, for, for anybody listening who wishes they had, you know, the best stuff that they don't have, take it from a person who's sort of done it before. It's not that it's all cracked up to be. And at the end of the day, people come back to like their roots. So I'm most excited about like a small vintage lens on like a tiny little, you know, a seven body right now and being able to just like carry that in my pocket, you know, like that's really exciting. And it's crazy that the image is as good as it is now. Yeah. Image quality. And I was telling you, we're, we're talking through text, the a seven S three, it's so dangerous. Like it's an incredible, incredible camera. It's a, it's a, it's a great feet to be able to put that image quality in such a small body uh where now it's it's challenging a camera that's three times its price so for you know you took this trip it's a it was a more of a personal trip but i the images that i saw you posting on social media was were beautiful a lot of the stuff i know you liked shooting stills a lot but i also saw you had your red camera out there shooting through the window of the RV at some animals in the wild. Mm, and yeah. what was that like? Oh, that was incredible. That was Antelope Island in uh, Salt Lake City, a place from what I understand not many people go to, even people that do live in Salt Lake City. My wife and I just looked at the map and I'm, I'm looking for the green, which is the national or the state parks. And I, I want to go there and, um, it was like the most perfect sunset you could have ever imagined. And, uh, these wild Buffalo that are just all over this Island, which is sort of like this sulfur Island. Um, again, nobody, nobody really goes there. I mean, people do, but, um, it's in the middle of the salt Lake and we stopped there on the way. Cause we were going from Utah to, to, to Jackson and the Tetons and Yellowstone. And that was, halfway through I mentioned like the gear and the size and stuff is because you can't I didn't want to talk about gear but it was sort of applicable because it's like when traveling you know if you're gonna hike up a mountain or summit a peak or something like that you're not gonna just nonchalantly bring like this giant camera you know or you're not gonna have a fun time if you're doing that unless you're on a commercial that somebody's paying you to do that but that buffalo was sweet, and I'm glad you asked because that was just for fun, and I wouldn't even call it on spec because it's just like that's what I do for fun. Um, we went to Yellowstone, which was I I can't if if you or anybody listening loves the outdoors, wildlife, and hasn't been to Yellowstone, and this isn't just like oh my gosh, this is a beautiful place. This is like this is the most insane place you could think of. Um, my wife and I kept saying we, we, this is like the garden of Eden because this is literally like what the world was like before people. And we went in late fall where the crowds were low, like anywhere you look or walk at any moment, there could be uh, bison or Buffalo. There could be grizzly bears, black bears. There could be wolves. There could be elk, foxes, coyotes, uh, antelopes and stuff. And not just like far off in the distance but like right up in your face like you have to carry bear spray wow. and walk with groups and it's it's invigorating like it, wow it makes you feel alive like you're scared that a grizzly bear is going to be around the corner of the next trail you're like this is heavy like i do not experience this in right you know your town or wherever you are um and what's really awesome is that there's a director that I've been friends with for many years. I went to high school with. He's in New Mexico, and he's doing a lot of stuff with the like Navajo Nation and stuff. And I really wanted to do something meaningful with the images that I got uh, in Yellowstone, and it just totally like without forcing it, it just came together. And he's he's taken on he's taken on this project where there's this woman who's reading a, a poem that she wrote 
about her feelings and how she responds to uh, conservation and the land and and the desert and they've put the images from uh, Utah and Yellowstone under her poem and it's really incredible um, so I'm excited to wow. share that and that's that's meaningful for me because I was very I was really hungry for something meaningful to happen with that footage and uh, something did like on accident so I'm, I'm thankful that's that's something to be thankful for that's fantastic and I think that that brings up the ordeal of deciding what camera like what equipment to bring on because there's there have been times where sometimes i'll say uh i want to bring my good camera out with me for fun and i don't end up catching much but then there are other times where i don't have my camera and like the best stuff happens that I wish I would have had the good camera, you know, and that's the struggle to and that's the struggle and the <laughs> desire to have the best camera that you possibly can for me, at least in that package that you're allowed to carry around at all times. And and I thought it exactly. was I wanted it to be the one DX Mark three for a while. Recently, it was the a seven S threes for a while or it was the a seven threes for a while. And now it's the a seven S three is just doing it for sure. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's such an incredible camera. Um, very, very capable too. Everything that you went through on this journey that you took, it was all it wasn't paid, correct? It was it was a personal, you know, vacation sort of that you took with your wife. If you were to translate this into a paid gig, let's say somebody pays you to go out and shoot some wildlife, what would you do differently? How would you sort of approach this, a project like that? I don't know if I would do anything differently. I'd probably learn like I'm it would be very specific stuff. Like I don't I, like very like minute stuff. I don't know if I would do a ton differently. It would be more so like we'd have a little bit of resources behind us. Um so I'd be able to do certain things. So it wouldn't necessarily be all that interesting stuff. There's a lot of stuff with the RV life that that there is to learn about like where to stay and where not to stay and um, that kind of stuff. But no, nah, I would just trust my gut like as much as I want to use. I'm even catching myself now, you know, as much as I want to use a certain prime or something, I would just try to simplify myself. You know, I would just try to, I've learned that lesson before and I'm continuing to learn the lesson. You know, you just got to keep your kit simple. I find that interesting um, that you wouldn't change too much. Like to me, that tells me that you're kind of always on that creative mode or, you know, ready to capture something, which is awesome because that's your, essentially your job, right? To, to do that kind of stuff. And you're always ready to shoot as if, as if you were working. Right. Yeah. Like constantly prepping and practicing and playing and stuff. I think that's very important, especially in, in, in our industry of creatives, right? constantly flexing your creative um discoveries you know so not only looking for new things to shoot but how to shoot them so i'm sure you found some do's and don'ts along the way as well um yeah you maybe know, you found some good, opportunities yeah yeah like go ahead when my wife and i went to kenya to shoot this paid doc in february of 2020 this weeks before covid became a thing I did what I had always done. I brought the tiniest camera possible. And in this, uh, I should say, the tiniest rig possible, the most simplest rig. And I really, really wanted to shoot it on the Red Gemini. And I mostly shot it on a 24 to 105. I did some. I did all the interviews on an 18 to 35 to get the shallow. Uh, and I barely whipped out like a 70 to 200, maybe once, barely. And I love what that what that was. And but I've always been in search for this sort of unicorn lens that doesn't exist. Uh, a, a more it sounds bad. It's the twenty four to one hundred five is like the most useful thing in the world, but it's the least sexy lens of all time. And I so desire like a twenty four to one hundred five two point eight that's like vintage or something that like has a little more character. And there's an ingenue, and there's a Tokina. 
but I don't know if they're that much better. And um, maybe I need to get a little bit out of my head. The What I did, part of the challenge to myself in Florida was I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to do, I'm going to try to shoot a super high-end dock on a big rig with an easy rig and Tokina Vista primes. And those lenses, I can, they're one of the first pieces of equipment, lenses specifically, that I can see my images on the computer and I'm like, wow, there's an instant upgrade. And I don't say that lightly. Like, there's a lot of fast glass out there. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, for me personally, I've been able to see what I've done on that. And I'm like, well, I can see an instant upgrade. There's something we crazy sweet going on with these lenses. So I wanted to shoot the dock, which sidebar, you know, people shoot, you know, well-funded docks get shot on people using easy rigs and giant cameras all the time, right? But in my world and mm -hmm. experience, that hasn't been my experience. If I go to Kenya for two weeks... I'm packing everything in my own bags and I'm bringing the absolute most minimal gear possible. So it was very different for me to, you know, decide to shoot this on Tokina Vista Primes, which means I need to use an easy rig because I can't handhold that without an easy rig. And I think the end product is going to be stellar because of it. But I wonder if it was worth it. You know, I wonder if everything was worth it. And I think... I think we'll be able to tell um, at the end of the day, but it's sort of a learning experience. It was, you know, zero funding and it was quick. I personally need more time. So it was like in and out. And I think if it was way chiller and we had more time, it would have 1000% been worth it. But the only reason why it may or may not have been worth it was, you know, I just personally needed more time down there. You know, I can't expect to be able to whip out a, crazy killer doc in 18 hours you know right but the cool thing about that as you explain it to me the cool thing is that now you know you can do it so you know the with jobs that come in they're hardly ever perfect so sometimes you'll get a job that might have to be rushed like that but now you know that you can provide a better product with those lenses because your client's requesting it, but you know you can do it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, and, I also and I'm sure know, you've learned. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, I, I also know, and I, I mean, it sounds basic, but I also know I've, I've always, I'm a prime guy, but at the same time, if I'm going to Kenya for two weeks to shoot a dock, I'm putting a 24 to 105 on there for a reason. Um, but after shooting the thing in Florida, like mostly on a 25, 40, and 85, I'm 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 excited and confident to throw like a vintage 35 mil prime on the A7 and just do something with that, you know, because you have more energy, you have more flexibility, you're you're less of an, you know, depending on what you're shooting, you know, if you're trying to be incognito. That's that's what to do, you know. Yeah, it all comes down to the state of that you're gonna be in, like understanding the shoot in general. Yeah, the worst thing you can do is not be be prepared but sometimes we don't have that luxury to even know what we're walking into uh, especially in documentary shooting um that's which which is what makes it tricky like it that run and gun style it's very very tricky it's hard to kind of predict how things are going to come out in some cases others you have a lot more control yeah and in yeah, a thousand percent. And in Yellowstone, you know, as much as I'd love to use a beautiful prime in Yellowstone, when you're shooting landscapes and wildlife, I think the most useful lenses for me are a 24 to 105 and a 100 to 400. That must be beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. I can't wait to share. Um, it's your number one, you're at altitude. And number two, if you're going to, Hey, let me run up that hill or something. You're, you're at altitude and you're not going to you got to bring, you know, there's different tools for different jobs, you know, you know, there's, there's a I place for zooms and there's a place for farms. Right. Yeah. I think that especially with people like me and you, um, it, it, it's really hard because I get it. Like the Vista primes, I'm sure it gives a 
gorgeous image and the perfect opportunity that you find to to find some animals in the wild uh, doing their thing with that sun hitting them just right, you're going to want to get the best lens that you have, you know, but now you're forcing yourself to do that extra work. Um, now you're on a job, you know, now it's like, how much do you put into working like you do on a real job or how much do you try to actually enjoy the moment, you know? Um, and it's not only for great outdoors, for anything. Like when I take equipment, like I don't want to have to fuss around with too much gear. So, you know, sometimes I sacrifice the nicer lenses to, to make room for other stuff. And I just don't want to be messing around with my cameras, which is even why sometimes, man, I'm setting my camera on aperture priority just because I like when I'm taking stills, not when I'm taking video. Um, but when I'm taking stills, I'll just set it to aperture priority. I don't want to be fussing with menus or anything like that. I know that my aperture will stay shallow. Like I always like it, um, snap that picture and with it being raw, I know I can edit it later. <clears throat> and just cause I, I rather spend more time enjoying the moment than capturing it, you know? Um, but it's that, that balance that you take when you, that you have to kind of consider when going on a vacation and taking equipment, you know, I have to remember that they're tools and, you know, they're tools for a certain job. So if the job calls for a 24 to 105 and a 100 to 400, that's awesome. You know, maybe for my own sake, you know, throw a fast 35 prime in there just to have it if you need it. But yeah, no, those lenses are great. 100 to 400 is sick. If you, if you are, or anybody. Yeah. Listening, uh, to it, it, it's so that's another thing. Um, what would you recommend in terms of that kind of stuff? for people to take with them and what variables should they consider when shooting outdoors? Uh, obviously I know sunlight is something, but, um, should they take something extra to sort of, uh, help with the yeah. elements of the outdoors or, uh, you mentioned earlier bear spray, <laughs> um, yeah. wouldn't consider putting that in my bag, but that sounds like Yeah. I mean, you gotta make sure if you're going to bring, you know, I'm again, the struggle is, you know, wanting to have the absolute most best gear of all time in your bag, right? So the Holy Trinity 2.8 zooms, you know, but there's something, you know, they don't make a 100 to 400 2.8. So you're at a 100 to 400 uh, f4 to 5.6 or whatever it is. That's a great lens, whether it's from Sony. I think Sony makes a 200 to 600 too, which is probably Holy the one cow. I would get if I was going to get a Sony. I think it's like it's inexpensive for what it is too. It's a slower lens. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's probably beautiful. So talking to myself to not overthink it, which is something that's hard to do and just try to simplify because you're not going to pull out a you know, a set of eight lenses, you know, primes. So I mean, maybe you will. Maybe somebody's going, yeah, I would. Uh, but in my experience, as much as I would love to, um, <laughs> yeah, a twenty-four to one hundred five and a one hundred to four hundred is the way to go. You don't want to, you don't want to run out of battery, you know. So if you're using a like a red camera or something that eats battery, you got to make sure you have V mounts or gold mounts, whatever you're using. And um, I like a lightweight rain jacket, just in a backpack or something, because you can always use that to cover the camera not only uh, for rain or dust or something, but also if you're um, trying to like keep a low profile, you can put a camera in a tote bag or you can cover it with a rain jacket and now nobody sees your super expensive camera. Um, yeah, I need snacks. I need snacks all the time. I try to do a back, do, I try to do a backpack instead of a roller bag if you're gonna uh, hike, um, you know, and then, and then media and trying to simplify and not bringing too much. That's the way to go. I would challenge yourself. I would challenge yourself around town or just in the, in life to start, you know, using like one lens and see what you can do with that. That's always a good practice. It might make you more comfortable with, uh, you know, traveling the world with only one or two lenses. Yeah, um, 
I noticed on one of your posts, you were using your red on sticks, getting a beautiful shot of, I can't remember what animal it was, but it was gorgeous. And it was definitely, it looked like a 70, I'm sorry, a 100 to 400. I know it was a long telephoto lens. Um, yeah, that's it. Beautiful, beautiful shot. But I couldn't help but think, like, obviously that shot worked out, and which is probably why you posted it, because it was a gorgeous, gorgeous shot. But to, to be trekking that all over the place, you know, looking for new shots, you know, must not be fun. Um, well, there's a reason why I'm doing it for fun, you know? So, like, some people... Well, some the people... fun part is getting the image, but... I mean, like what we spoke about before, um, how much trouble do you go through? Do you go through to capture this stuff, right? Now, to me, that's like, man, that's a job. I would like to capture it in a, I, this is the way I'm thinking it, you, you know? So, um, you know, I want to capture it in the most efficient way possible with the best quality possible. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to potentially, you know, lose shots because I'm setting the sticks, balancing it out. Uh, getting it all framed up, I guess. But, you know, these are things that I'm thinking about preliminarily, not having done that before, you know? Yeah, well, the thing about that 100 to 400, it has IS and image stabilization, and actually, I can actually hand-hold the small red build with a 100 to 400 and hold it, like, in last-minute ditch effort. There's, like, a black bear out the window, and I wanted to get that. You know, my wife pulls over, and I, like, do it without sticks. But that lens, realistically, is is pretty easy it's not much bigger than it's it's the same exact size as a 70 to 200 um i i sort of hear what you're saying um that is the tame version of me like that is the that is like the lower that 100 to 400 is the lesser lens like most well, people right there was a there was mm -hmm. a grizzly bear there was a famous like if anybody knows anything about Yellowstone and like is into it this year, there was like a very famous, it's, it was on YouTube and stuff. A, a grizzly bear took out this elk in the river and it was like on display for everybody. And, um, we rolled up to it and there was like a line of guys and, you know, like you've got the 100 to 400, which is like the entry level lens. Then there's like the 200 to 400 that has a teleconverter built into it. And then there's like four or five and 600 primes. And then like the, like the cream of the crop lens is like the 60 to $80,000 Canon Cine 50 to 1000 that like, like the old man beast of a dude, like who's been there for like 40 years had, but it's not about like having that gear. It's just that lens isn't even that much. So that's what I do for fun. So you're saying like some people might think that's not so much fun. Like this is yeah, what I do for fun, you know? Consider, consider that you're talking to someone that I would, most of the time I'm, I'm using my A7S III um, and I'm pulling out the FX9, un, not rigged, just like bare uh, when my client pays for it. So, and I'm talking to somebody that, basically every shoot you're shooting on red that's fully kitted out rigged out you know and uh, you know i've seen your setups they're pretty intense so there's a different there's a very big difference in ways that we work right not that i wouldn't rig out my fx9 but i just usually don't which is why to me i'm looking at that i'm like man that is uh uh a lot of work to to trek that from my yeah. point of view right because it's just not how i'm used to working you're you're used to working way more to to get your your kits and your setups your setups are looking nice i have been seeing the behind the scenes uh you know but it definitely takes some time to to piece that together i'm sure you don't show up and in 20 minutes or 30 minutes that's set up already um, no, I as mean, opposed to like so, sort of my setups is usually I can get them set up pretty quickly, but I'm used to working as a one man band, very minimal crew. Um, you know, you're on sort of different sets for, from what I've seen. Yeah. Recently. I mean, but you know, rewind a year or two ago or three years ago or 
or not even that long ago, like, you know, I am or I still think consider myself that guy or think, you know, I am sort of that one man band guy. But for me personally, there was a couple things. Number one, that's not sustainable for the my goals that I had for myself. And number two, based on those goals that I have for myself, I wanted to do, you know, next level things. So yes, my desire, my attention to detail is for those things. And it's sort of either willing them to make it happen or you get hired for something that sort of either, either levels you up or what have you. Uh, and you need to there are a few different things and it's not even about the camera. It's not even about the lenses. It's mostly about planning and the lights and stuff um, that can really sort of take you to the next level. And luckily I've had a handful of opportunities that have, that, you know, have been presented to me where I could capitalize on an opportunity and try to knock something out of the park and, and sort of, the, the idea is to get better work on your site, you know, every every moment you can in order to, uh, you know, sh- sh- have a better product. Right. That's good. That's awesome. That's uh, that's great that your goals are becoming a, a realization. Um, but I, and I think that's relatively uh, directed um, as a result of how you're used to working and that you're constantly focused on that kind of stuff. Cause when I see the things that you're posting, um, they look gorgeous and throughout the years they have definitely been getting better. Um, and that's no doubt as a result of like your constant passion for imagery and, you know, like you mentioned a second ago, attention to detail. So that's really, really cool. Thank you for the kind words. It means a lot to hear. Um, because you get caught up like it sort of is like mind numbing at a certain point not not that not that you're looking for it but I personally recently have been like my mind is going through so many different ideas for the future and like what's the next move um not just in one direction but in like six at a time and um thank you you know for saying that and I'm sort of taming myself in a sense of like, even this morning I'm on calls with people, you know, talking about ideas and projects and stuff. And it's like, okay, like I need to focus on this stuff. Like I have big things that I'm editing currently that need to go out. That is like the biggest and best stuff that I've ever done. I need to do that like right now. (laughs) And all these crazy ideas that I have, like I need to, I need to prioritize a little bit here. That's good. And some of that is paid work and some of it, some of it is just your self-improvement or is it like all just projects that have been coming in and um, you're just capitalizing and taking that opportunity to really put out some great stuff. stuff. The stuff that I'm currently editing right now is paid work that I was referring to. Um, But there is always that, passion project slash spec project and then there's also like entrepreneurial ideas that are just in my head you know you there's so much pressure from and it's not even a social media pressure thing but there is social media pressure and it's crazy the amount of pressure and there's very successful people out there that are doing a ton of stuff and um there's you know, I I have a mixed feeling about it all because I personally am entrepreneurial. Before I did this whole thing, I had a restaurant and I've been, you know, starting projects and selling stuff and, you know, for a while. And, and, uh, I have ideas and I'm trying to implement them and figure out which ones, you know, like, so I'm figuring stuff out, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm, kind of sort of the same way and uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine earlier where you know I just I I used to work from my home now I had to open up an office and I had to hire somebody I'm completely out of my comfort zone doing this um, 
but I've been getting told by, you know, my mentors and those that I look to for counsel on regarding my business affairs, uh, about expanding it, scaling. And my whole thing has always been, well, you know, it's really, it, it, it's, it's hard because you could either be an artist or a businessman, you know? And for the longest time, I've always considered like kind of what I do is, is, uh, it's kind of like art, what we do, you know? And it's, it's hard to, when you think about scaling and doubling, making, you know, two of you and all that stuff, it was very, uh, vague to me. I don't know if I understood it properly. So right now I'm in that process or trying to be in that process. And, uh, it's very different. So when I made the decision to finally hire somebody, you know, I knew we could not work remotely. So it had to be at the same place and all that stuff, which is why I had to get an office and whatnot. So, but now I'm in that mode where I'm transitioning from, you know, I don't have to fully let go of the art part, but I have to turn kind of business mentality and start seeing how I'm going to maintain this new sort of business that I'm doing now. So it's uh so now like wheels are rolling complete in a completely different sort of direction. I honestly thought I was going to be freelancing for the rest of my life or career. But like you said, it's, you know, the point is to grow. You want to go somewhere from there, you know? Um, so that's sort of where I'm at as well. Yeah. Um, there's a book that I'm listening to currently called the four hour work week. And I highly recommend everybody listens to it. Um, sort of giving away my most recent secret. Um, it's not about working four hours a week. It's about a number of different things. But speaking to the entrepreneur or someone that needs to get a hold of their priorities or scale or what have you or a person like myself or you is um is a lot about automation and also um outsourcing so super quick example just a takeaway i had from the book uh, that helped me personally because i need to before i outsource or automate certain things i need to like get myself in order and automate some very basic things so real quick i have um over a dozen mentorees, which is incredible. And I am right in the beginning of the year here where I have a list of them. And I was like, sort of overwhelmed on like how to schedule them, like email back and forth. What's it? What's a good time for you? What's a good time for me? Times 14. Or, you know, I have a spreadsheet, whatever. Um, but based on this book, and what takeaway I got from this book is that I found a service online called youcanbook.me and it's a prompt connected to my Google Calendar that I, all I had to do was write one email with all of them blind CC'd and say, hey, book your monthly calls using this link. Done. Completely done. I mean, all of the hours of back and forth i mean it's it's done in in like less than five minutes in that one email so that's a that's a that's a tangible example of automation and outsourcing i outsourced that labor that i was going to have to do to a software um and you can imagine the possibilities with that for me personally you know and the thing is is like when you for for folks like us as your Instagram grows, as your as potentially your uh, your assets grow, whatever they look like, you want to you want to leverage those things. So, with more camera or more savings account or more followers or what have you, you can turn that into more of whatever. And for a person like me. I'm trying to figure that out. I'm at a point where I'm figuring out and assessing what what I should do. And I don't know exactly what I should do. And that's the problem, that there's too many options. Yeah, I thought that that was a really cool software that you sent me the link to book you for this uh, podcast, which made it even easier for me. We didn't have to have like a, 
a long back and forth to see when when the time works for both of us. Uh, but it does bring up a question because I thought it was interesting and I actually considered it myself. You know, sometimes as freelancers that we are, we'll get a last minute booking, you know, and it could be a good job, a good shoot that pays off really well. <clears throat> but it's in a couple of days. They need somebody. You know, what do you do if you're already booked? Are you going to move some things around or um, and yeah. how often? I don't know if that happens often for you. It happens every now and then for me um if uh it depends on the booking right so if a friend wants to call me if a friend wants to call me or a mentoree has a call and someone is trying to book me for a incredible job it's those people that are holding that booking are going to completely understand that i have to take the job um so i haven't run into that yet and it you know, but there's enough space on the calendar. Um, I had a I had a a person today representing an organization asking me if I was free next month, and she said I can see you're free on the day based on the schedule, but I just want to make sure. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, it was far out enough. So that's not like I'm not just blanketly sending that link to everybody, but it's a tool that I'm using. Um, the next tool for me personally is, um, friends that are producers and directors that want to go out and pitch on behalf of me. So historically I've been on the defense call comes in. Hey, can, can you do a video? Um, yes, but I want to be on the offense. I want to. I want to pitch, you know, I have enough work now that I can pitch and that's what I need to do and want to do. And that's sort of one of the focuses that I need to get kind of going. And I personally don't want to have this be a one man thing. I can only handle so much like you're not going to be crushing like your life away at the computer every single day, all day. Like I, re I, I want to empower people like I want to hire a producer, you know, I want to hire a team. That's why I hire. Most recently, I've hired potentially people more people than I've needed, because I like on bringing my friends on board. And I like having an extra pair of hands, not only because it's sort of blessing them. But it's it's also making things more sustainable. Um, so at the end of the day, you're stoked on the day and you have energy because you had friends and help and hands and you weren't the director, DP and PA. Um, and then the next day you can do it again because you have a sustainable model. So that's just a bunch of random stuff. I love that, man. Maybe the next time you're on the show, we could talk about pitching once you get your yeah. feet wet there and see what you learn. <laughs> We could have a whole episode on that, I'm sure. Definitely. I mean, ri totally. Um, I listened to a I listened to a thing most recently. A guy on YouTube um, had a pitch to Netflix. It's a video you can watch it, and he says um, he's a successful guy. He says um, a no is just a not yet. So that helped me because there's a lot of people I sent my reel to this time last year who were all in and then COVID struck and there is nothing stopping me from just sending them a nice email just saying I hope you had a great New Year's uh, I just want to you know open up that conversation again that's good that's good it's definitely a good tactic to take especially if you lost a lot of work I'm sure a lot of us did for sure What's your, um, what's your, what's your biggest challenge these days? What are you, uh, trying to figure out or focus in on well, or what, what are your goals for the next? Um, I gotta tell you, man. Um, I've had pretty, where some doors closed for me, others opened talking about the whole lockdown thing. Um, that's one of the benefits of being a freelancer is that you don't only have one client that's, you know, if that client goes, you're uh, 
you know, I'm talking to people that have normal jobs, which is nothing wrong with that. But as a freelancer, I have several clients, right? And there were a, a small handful that stayed pretty operational during the lockdowns um, or during the whole pandemic that I was still able to make, you know, a good living still. Um, and there were other opportunities that rose that I was able to take advantage of. And uh, it, it still ended up being a pretty good year for me. Um, so now uh, that that's how, you know, I handled that. But now the the struggle now is just this whole, like I mentioned earlier, this whole new uh, sort of structure that I'm sort of starting now with an office and uh, a, a full, an editor. And I'm actually looking to pretty soon get a second editor um, for a project that uh, might be coming my way. So it's just kind of handling that. I'm used to doing everything myself. So delegating, I would, I, you know, if I have to narrow it down, it would be that. Uh, delegating properly um effectively and making sure that you know i'm making the most out of the resources that i have and you know that's really going to come down to trial and error and at the same time seeking advice all the time and making sure that the people that have been there before are constantly letting me know their opinions on what i'm doing like the routes that i'm taking mm -hmm. reading books probably audio books in my case <laughs> Uh, but yeah, all of that, that, stuff. um, that, that's all good. Um, that audiobook I think could definitely be a win for you. I'll say that, um, I did the first season of Sennheiser Pro Talks by myself. And then the second season I hired, I trained and hired an editor to do the second season. And now fast forward three years it's definitely driven by the lack of sustainability but as much as i love the creative process of editing and color is separate but as much as i love the creative process of editing i don't always want to do it and that's driven by sustainability it's sort of like i'm too tired to do it i want to focus on what i love most which is not editing and i would say the fear for some people might be, I don't want to give this money away. I don't want to give a third of the f or whatever. But I will I will tell you now, if you have big plans and big dreams and to be a DP and all that stuff, get get the editor and start and stop editing. And but but make sure your your quality has to be there. You know, I was I'm micromanaging that editor in a good way to make sure that that person is editing like it's me editing. So that has to be there, but but I definitely recommend, you know, building a team. And I could definitely tell you, I, I could relate to the whole micromanaging thing. My editor is listening to this right now and he's probably uh, laughing because he knows how I micromanage. But it's like you said, like I want them to edit the way that I edit uh, because of that, though. Uh, but I'm just like you. I as you know, I love the creative process as well, but you know, I could do without the editing. <laughs> so that's something that, cause in my opinion, like you could always re edit, you know, for me, I enjoy the production a lot more. I think that's a lot more fun. Um, and that's something that has to get done correctly always. Um, and so I definitely make sure that we have more work coming in and I'm on top of that. And if there's things that need to be edit, you know, edited, they can handle that. So, um, I'm, I'm right there with you on the, on that whole thing. But, um, anyways, man, this was a great episode. Thank Thanks you. so much for coming on. Uh, dude, it feels like it's a whole new Julian for some reason. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the longer hair or the, the longer the, beard. <laughs> I think oh it's, man. I think it's the first beard I've ever had in my life. And, uh, I used to have really long great, hair. Man. I appreciate that, man that's uh, it takes time dude uh yeah i was telling before the the show i was telling my editor how man you used to be clean cut man now it's like you just came from the outdoors and oof you got some roughness going on there <laughs> it's looking great though man yeah, that's what he said. i was like my wife i used to have long hair maybe 10 years ago like really long hair and i i told my wife a couple <laughs> months back i was like i, I might want to do it again what do you think and she's like oh <laughs> I was like, why not? You gotta send us, you gotta send us a picture to post on iFilmmaker Instagram of your long hair. 
We'll do a throwback to Julian Jari, and then we'll do one Julian today. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I'll talk to you soon. I Absolutely. See you, buddy. So there you have it. That is my conversation with Julian Jari. As you can see, we just we could go on forever. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know how did you like this episode? How do you like this podcast and how it's going? Let us know over on Instagram. We're pretty active over on Instagram at I Filmmaker Podcast and on Facebook. We have a Facebook group as well. You can also leave your comments on our website. It's ifilmmakerpodcast.com. Thank you guys for listening to this episode, and we'll see you on the next one.